Hey guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome back to the Golang Design Pattern Tutorial Series. In today's video, we're going to be covering two patterns. We'll be covering the generator pattern and then we will look at the observer pattern. So first let's start with the generator pattern. So a generator is a special function that is used to control the iteration behavior of a loop. In fact, all generators are technically iterators. If you've ever worked with Python or Dart, you'll be used to the term generator. In Python, for instance, a generator is a function that doesn't have a return keyword, but rather uses the yield keyword. In Dart, on the other hand, you have the star async generator, which allows you to create a stream. In Go, generators make use of channels, and so they can either be synchronous or asynchronous. And so ultimately, a generator is just a function, but it behaves like an iterator. All right, so let's go ahead and create a generator function here. And I'm going to use the Fibonacci algorithm for this. So we'll create a function called Fibonacci and it'll take in one single integer and then it will return a channel of integer type. So we want to go ahead and make our channel of integer type. So we just say make chan int and this will be called out. And then of course we're going to return this channel. And inside of this function, we'll have another anonymous function running. Inside of this anonymous function, we'll create a for loop, which essentially uses what is, in essence, a list comprehension to generate our Fibonacci sequence, which will look like this. And if the Fibonacci sequence starts with 0 and 1, we then add those two together to get 1, and then we add the next two values together to get 2, and then we repeat that pattern and so in our for loop, we take 0, we put it into i. We then take 1 and we put it into j. And then we have a condition here that says we want to continue the loop so long as i is less than n. We move forward and we take i and j, which would be 0 and 1, add them together, put them into i, and then we put 0 into j. So then for the next iteration, i is 1, j is 0. We add those together, that gives us another 1 for i. And of course, because the last i was 1, that gets put into j. So now we have 1, 1 for i and j. So then these two get added together and we get 2 for i. Our original 1 gets put into j. So then that gives us 3 and then 5 and then 8 and 13 and so on. And of course, we're only really concerned about i as far as output goes. So we're going to take the i value and pipe it into our out channel. Now keep in mind that the execution of these two functions will happen asynchronously. Fib will execute, will create the channel, and then will spawn a go routine which has this logic inside of it, which will run the for loop. And while that's happening, we'll pass the out channel back to the main function. And so this outer function will end, but this go routine will continue executing. So now we can go ahead down to our main function and use the fib function like an iterator. And because we're receiving a channel from our fib function, we can use a for loop to iterate through the sequence of values that are coming from our generator function. So we can just say for x in range fib 10 million, and we'll then print out each of the x values as we get them from our out channel. Now we can go into our terminal and execute our program. And you'll see here that we will get our Fibonacci sequence. We do have an error here and I've deliberately made a mistake to show you guys this error. So the error tells us that all of the go routines are asleep and that we've hit a deadlock. What essentially is happening here is that our channel is still open. And so the for loop here is expecting to get another value from the channel because it's still open. And as a result, it throws a deadlock. So the program doesn't really get the chance to exit properly. And so we need to close the channel after our for loop finishes. So inside of our anonymous function, we just want to call defer close and then pass in our channel, which will then close our channel, which will then close our channel when the anonymous function finishes its execution. And that's it. This is a generator function that we've created here, and it generates a Fibonacci sequence that is less than the value of n that we input into the function. 
And of course, you could use this pattern to generate really any kind of sequence of data. All right, so now that we've finished the generator pattern, let's go ahead and take a look at the observer pattern. And we're actually going to use our generator function to demonstrate the observer pattern. In the observer pattern, we create a object or a data structure, which we can call a subject. This subject maintains a list of other objects which wants to know about what's happening with this object. And we can call these other objects observers. And the idea is that as the main object changes, as the subject changes, it will automatically notify them of these state changes. You'll be familiar with the observer pattern if you've ever used any RX libraries or ReactiveX libraries. In ReactiveX, you have observables and you have subjects. The subjects are the part that actually implements the observer pattern in this way, where they contain some kind of state, and then they also contain a list of observers that are listening to the subject. All right, so let's go ahead and define a bunch of different types. First, let's define an event type. The event type will be a data type that we're going to send to our observers when our Fibonacci generator generates a new Fibonacci number. We want to attach to this struct a piece of data which will be an integer and this will essentially just be the integer that's going through our channel. Now along with our event we want to create an interface for our observer type and the observer type will implement a notify callback function which will just take in an event and then we can use this to define the logic for what the observer will do when it gets notified of an event. We'll create another interface here which we'll call subject and the subject will be the item that we're listening to and of course we want the subject to also maintain a list of the objects that are listening to it. We can add three functions to our subject. We'll have an add listener function which will take in an observer type. Then we'll have a remove listener function which will also take in an observer type. And then we'll have the notify function which will take in the event type. And of course notify will be called when we get some kind of event that we want to then notify our observers with. Now we can go and create a struct for each of our observers. So each of our observers will have an ID and then they'll also maintain a bit of time. And so essentially what we'll do is we'll be able to find how long it takes the fib function to produce a new value. And finally, we'll create an event subject struct, which will contain a sync map, which will contain a list of the observers that are listening to this event subject. All right, so now we need to implement our interfaces for each of our struct types. So we need to implement the observer interface for the event observer struct type so that it will be an observer type. And then we need to implement the subject interface for the event subject type so that it will be a subject type. For our event observer, we'll implement the notify callback function and notify callback takes in an event. This function, of course, is the callback function that gets executed when we get notified of an event. And so what we want to do is just print out that we've received the data on the event after a certain amount of time. And we can get our time by calling time.since on e.time, which is just our event observer field. We can go ahead and implement add listener and remove listener for our event subject. And of course, these take in the observer type for the first one. All we're going to do is just take the observer type, store it into our map, and then store it with an empty anonymous struct as its value. Then with the remove listener method, we'll take in the observer, and then we'll call s.observersDelete on that observer to delete it from the map. If an observer is in our map, then it's a listener. If it's not in our map, then it will not be a listener. The notify method will be a little bit more complicated than the others because we want to add logic which will allow us to iterate through the map of observers and then pass an event to each of those observers. The sync map type has a method on it called range and we can use this method to iterate through all of the keys and values inside of the map. Now this range function takes in a function and the function We'll have the key, which is an interface type, the value, which is also an interface type, and then it will return a Boolean. If it returns true, then it will continue to iterate, and if it returns false, 
then it will stop iterating through the map. And so we can set up a little if statement to just check to see if the key itself is nil. And if that key doesn't exist, then we'll return false. And so what this means is that it will just iterate through the values that exist in the map. And then once it hits the end of that list, it'll have a empty key. And then it will just return false, which will stop the iteration. And I made a mistake up here. I was passing an observer in as a parameter. The notify function needs to take in an event. Here, after we've checked to see if the key is nil, we can then take the key and then execute the notify callback method on that key, which is the observer, of course. And then we can pass in the event that we want to pass to this observer. Now, of course, this is going to throw an error because the key is currently an interface type. And so we need to take the key and cast it as an observer. And we can do it by just saying key.observer in parentheses like this dot notify callback. And we'll then just return true like this. That way the iteration will continue until we hit an empty key. We can also go ahead and expand this little if check and we can just say if key is equal to nil or the value is equal to nil, then we'll return false. Either way, it should be all right. We can come down to our main function and set things up so that we use the observer pattern. So first we can go ahead and create our event subject, which will contain our observers map. We can then set up our observers. I'm just going to create two of them and we'll just have observer of ID one and then observer of ID two. And then both of these will also have their time fields just be time dot now. So they'll just get the timestamp from when they were created. We can then take these observers and put them into our add listener method on our event subject. So n.addListener, and then we pass in the reference for observer1, and then a reference for observer2. And then finally, we can have a for loop like we had before, which will iterate through our generator function, and then call n.notify, and create a new event with data. And then the data, of course, will be the x value in our for loop. So now we can go ahead and run our program we'll get each of our values twice because both of our observers are receiving the values each time a value is created by our generator. So we get 0, 0, then we get 1, 1, and then 1, 1 again, then 2, 2, and then 3, 3, and 5, 5, and so on. And this will just keep going. And actually, to make this a little bit clearer, let's go ahead and just add the observer ID to the print function here. So we'll just say observer ID, so observer one received the value after the time. And so of course now we can see observer two received zero after zero seconds, and then one received zero after 1.24 milliseconds, and then this will just keep going. Of course the order that the observers receive the events is not guaranteed because this is all asynchronous. In this case our observer two got the zero event first, and then observer one received that event. And if we go all the way down to the end, you can see that observer one received this value after 32 milliseconds, whereas observer two received that same value after 33 milliseconds. So even the time will change in some cases as well. Now, finally, let's add some logic to remove one of our observers after a certain period of time. Above our for loop, we can create a anonymous function on a go routine and of course execute it immediately. And inside of this function, we'll just have a select block, which will have a single case. And the case will check for a channel that will send a piece of data after 10 milliseconds. And when that piece of data comes through, we'll call n.removeListener on our first observer which will then remove it from our map and then should stop it from getting notifications. And now if we run our application, if we scroll up to where 10 milliseconds happens, you can see that the first observer stops receiving data and the second observer continues to receive data. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you just like this video, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. If you'd like to catch the next video in the Golang Design Pattern Tutorial series, then you should go ahead and click that notification bell. Have a good night.